This is the unfiltered truth about entrepreneurship. Raw, no BS, no sugarcoating. Welcome to Entrepreneur Intel. I'm your host, Wes Matthews. Each episode, we'll learn from experienced founders and uncover the top 5% learnings that led to their success in all things personal, family, and business. This show is sponsored by Stealth Consulting, delivering clear marketing strategies, ROI, and no surprises. I am super excited for today's guest. Uh, He is a former Navy SEAL and Marine who created the Two Minute Report that quickly informs over 30,000 decision makers across the special operations, paramilitary, and clandestine service community. Uh, He was a program manager for the Department of Defense. He's managed over a billion dollars in programs on different voting systems. He is the CEO and founder of the SOFX Network. Welcome, Sam Havelock. Hey, how are you? Oh, awesome, Sam. I, I'm so appreciative to be here. I, I can't wait to unpack uh, your intro. It's it's pretty fascinating to me. But I got to start. I ask every guest the same question. Uh, so your company has about 12 headcount, uh, about $4 million in revenue, and you've been doing this for about 11 years. What's the most important lesson you've learned thus far in this entrepreneurial journey? Sure. Um, I think it's often repeated, or at least I've seen it, and then it took essentially years and years to sink in, but I absolutely believe it's sort of the holy grail of uh, commandments with regards to entrepreneurialism. And I think that the holy grail, uh, it was mentioned by Steve Jobs and uh, uh, Ivy, so on and so forth, that, that focus is the most important thing. Like if I had to roll back the clock 11 years back, once I retired at a, the uh, U.S. Special Operations community, you know, I had a set of ideas with regards to what I wanted to create as an entrepreneur um, and to feed my own intellectual curiosity. As as is the case with many entrepreneurs, they love to ideate on all sorts of different things, but sometimes your greatest strengths become your biggest weaknesses. And uh, if I were to roll back the clock, I'd say, in order to generate the type of traction and momentum you need to push an early stage venture forward in time and capability, you have to focus like a laser. So just to reiterate, you were a Marine and then you became a Navy SEAL? Yes. Is that the order? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So for me, like I'm an entrepreneur and I apologize because I'm not, you know, maybe super ignorant when it comes to the military, but I, I look at Navy SEALs as like super focused. I mean, what what is the... Like, what's a good data point of it? Like, what does it take to become a, a Navy SEAL? Or like, what's the percentage? Or, you know, I hear things about boot camp. Or like, how hard is that to become a, a Navy SEAL? I think um, if we were, statistically speaking, if we were to say that um, on average, if there's maybe 150 entrants per class, per BUDS class, and BUDS stands for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training, um, typically there's usually around anywhere from 15 to 20 original class members that graduate with that class. Now that doesn't mean you won't have additional graduates in that class because oftentimes you'll have injury rollbacks or other people that started in an earlier class, but graduated with you. So let's say, you know, statistically speaking, uh, about 10% of the people who enter BUDS eventually graduate. Um, that's for a variety of reasons. I think more often than not, it's that people don't get, they get in over their head because they don't, um, they probably underestimated the grit and determination and stick to it would take, which is no different than entrepreneurialism, right? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I want to save it for later, but like, what's harder? You know, I mean, there's probably some days where you're like, uh, I mean, because I mean, I give you, I, I, I've, I've only here, right? Like I think until as an entrepreneur, like you have to experience things yourself to go through it, but Correct. I can only like hypothesize about a Navy SEAL, like you hear things, but until you go through it. So like early, early on, like, was that your like natural path where you're like, I'm just going to go in the military. Is that what you want to do from an early, early, early age or. I was the type of kid who was constantly reading soldier of fortune magazine, getting dressed up in camis that were way too big for me, running around in the woods, you know, playing war and stuff with, so I always knew I wanted to be in the profession of arms. 
And so it basically, the college that I went to was the Citadel. It was a military college in South Carolina. I was always drawn to that concept of being a soldier. Um, and so I would graduate from the Citadel, go into the Marine Corps. And um, you, that was extremely valuable set of learnings. I think anything that I did in Naval Special Warfare in my SEAL team career was because of the training I got in, in the Marine Corps and at the Citadel how, having to deal with hard things. I don't think I probably, I probably couldn't have made it through BUDS had I not been an experienced Marine, having been through Nob Year at the Citadel. I was both an enlisted and an officer Marine, so I'd been through boot camp at Paris Island and then uh, OCS, you know, in the Marine Corps, so, and then Nob Year at the Citadel. So by the time I hit BUDS, I was already, had been through sort of, let's call them, three or four trials by fire ahead of that. So it wasn't too different for me. I knew what to expect when I showed up at Bud's, even though I was an old guy by then. I was 28 when I first showed up at Bud's, which is not typical. Me meaning on the, you're on the younger side or older side? or Older, what's... yeah. A tip, older, more okay. typically, it's uh, you'll, you'll find people about 19 to about 24 is the 20. 26 is the sweet spot of of where people typically uh show up at buds so going through that like what is that experience like you know to go through you know you're, you're a marine and then you go through to become a, a navy seal which you know, sure. you know as you mentioned only 10 percent of that group makes it to that level is that sort of where that stops or is there more advancement from there or can you talk a little bit about that transition into that sure um well i had an extreme set of incentives to make it through buds because essentially the reason I wound up in the Navy at all is because I'd gotten kicked out of flight school in the Marine Corps. And so they had, they had assigned me <laughs> into an occupational field that was for the most part, all administration, straight of things and like personnel records and things I had absolutely no intention of doing for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I pestered the department of the Navy for two years solid to, give me a shot at going to BUDS uh, to the extent where I was essentially resigning my commission as a Marine officer, a captain at that point, in order to enlist in the Navy to go to BUDS. Well, the Bureau of Naval Personnel was like, well, we're not too comfortable with a captain of Marines going in as an E1 in the Navy. And in fact, there's a restriction against that. So basically, we'll make this exception and we'll let you go in as a lieutenant. But if you don't make it, like one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get kicked out of the Navy or you're going to go to a service warfare officer school to learn how to drive ships and do that kind of stuff. So like for me, it was basically burn the ships. I've got to get through this because I didn't want to, I certainly didn't want to conclude uh, a naval career on a low note. And I cert and I really didn't, not to take anything away from the great work that the service warfare officer community does, but I just didn't have a knack for driving boats, ships. <laughs> so, you know, part of your intro, you know, talking about, you know, you managed over a billion dollars in programs, like how, how, how large is the U S government defense and all, and all this? I mean, is a billion dollars, like, is that a little, is that a yeah, lot? It's a rounding error in the big scheme of things. They spend okay. billions upon billions of dollars each year, uh, in procurement, research, development, testing, and evaluation in operational funding, uh, all kinds of different things. Um, when we talk about a billion dollars worth of assets, what we're really talking about is expensive combat systems. So in the big scheme of things, I was a program manager managing a billion dollars worth of assets at US Special Operations Command, but these were expensive boats that carried SEALs around the world doing the things that Naval Special Warfare uh, typically does. Everything from high-speed assault craft to riverine boats to then they had uh, patrol coastal boats and Mark Fives and 11-meter ribs, all fancy terms for where the inventory of boats that are assigned to naval special warfare. So the reason I wound up managing boats uh, was just because I had uh, a background in the community. I was the executive officer of a boat team in years prior, so I had at least enough functional understanding to uh, to not get in the way of my very experienced assistant program managers that did all the work. Right? I would take <laughs> the blame for stuff, but they were the they were the resident subject matter experts on 
all things having to do with the boats. Do you find, is there a traditional path for Marines or, you know, ex Navy SEALs? I mean, is it, you know, is, is entrepreneurship like a typical route or is that again, another 10% of the, you know, guys who retire out of, out of service? Right. Um, so I happen to have a theory of special operations that the majority of people in special operations, whether it's SEALs, Green Berets, Rangers, Delta Force, what have you, from a personality standpoint, are natural born entrepreneurs in that they seek risk, not for seeking risk's sake, but because they, they like to be in control of decisions. They like just to make direct impacts. They thrive under conditions of stress, pressure, and ambiguity. They are, they seek alternatives and the ability to use their creativity and imagination on a day-to-day basis. I don't think that the special operations community personally, that your average soldier, sailor, airman, or marine in U.S. Special Operations or any other Special Operations Force has a lock on bravery, athleticism, physical prowess, all the things that most people think of when they think of Special Operators. And the reason I say that is because all of those characteristics are extremely resonant in the infantry units, in a variety of other warfare specialties across all the militaries, all the military uh, branches. So it's not that. It's not superior service, like a a deeper desire to serve. All service men and women serve, right? It's just different types of service that are provided. So when you look, when you start to boil away, well, if it's not strength, athleticism, so on and so forth, what is it? What is that thing that sits at the heart of every special operator? And I think it's that um, desire to serve in a context that gives you a lot more creative degrees of freedom. And that's that if, if that thesis works, it starts to explain a whole lot about why soft guys drive the rest of the conventional military nuts when they show up at a base with their long hair and their strange uniforms. And it's almost as if they're trying to act differently. They, they are different. They would not do well in the conventional military, typically. That, that's not always the case. But more often than not, the people that found themselves in the special operations community would have had a harder time conforming to the constraints of and rigidity of uh, more typical conventional forces. So it's kind of cool. So you're 28, which is kind of late to become a SEAL, and then you kind of parlay into into becoming an entrepreneur. So introducing you in in your company, it's a two minute report that informs 30,000 individuals um, across special ops, paramilitary, clandestine service community. What what transpired from leaving the, and I'm I'm saying leaving the military, assuming you left, to becoming an entrepreneur? Like, what's that time frame look like? Sure. Um, Well, well, I would, basically, so I retired out of uh, the the Navy in uh, September of 2012, um, and my intention was to become an entrepreneur. Um, but basically the impetus behind what is now called the SOFX report, which is basically a daily newsletter that goes out to uh, over 30,000 people, um, was to really inform the community about open source reporting that was on the internet or nowadays in social channels that was talking about the community because oftentimes I believed that we were so heads down focused on our mission that we oftentimes didn't take the time to even understand what the world was saying about us on the outside, right? We, we don't, didn't have the time to be on Quora, <laughs> what nowadays, on Quora, on Reddit. We didn't have the time yep. to be scouring the world's different news sources for articles and opinion pieces on special operations. So what the SOFX report does, essentially, is we've got a team. We glo- we scour the, all the globe's uh, news feeds and social media sources, so on and so forth. We find the most impactful uh, pieces of content that are out there. 
we analyze them, depoliticize, depoliticize them, summarize them, and then publish them to the community so that our community understands what is being said about them out in the real world. We never do reporting on the community. We don't, that's like, that violates so many different sensibilities about the choir professional, right? We, you'll never catch us doing an interview, like a behind the scenes team room interview of what certain NCOs might think about a certain command decision. That's not what we do at all. We just take a look at the world. What has happened over the past 24 hours in the world of special operations, private military contracting or paramilitary operations, and clandestine service slash the uh, the intelligence community that has basically appeared in open source reporting, and then we package that and deliver it back to the community. So, so you retire in in 2012, yeah. 2012 and you're like, I want to be an entrepreneur. Did you discover? Did you come out and you're like, I want to be an entrepreneur, and then then like there was this void, and you're like, I'm going to pursue this, or did you know that that void existed, and they're like, I. I can maybe become an entrepreneur and, and build this and monetize this. Cause I'm, I'm thinking that you probably, re I would reflect and say, man, if while I was serving, if I would have had this information, this would have been really helpful. You discover that it took action. So I'm just, I'm curious around which one came sure. first, like what was stronger? Um, I always had a, uh, I always wanted to be a, my plan. The, oh, the plan was always to be an entrepreneur. Once I got out of the military, there was no, if sends or butts. I did not contemplate not a chance to go work for Lockheed or General Dynamics. It's, you know, looking back, it probably would have been easier <laughs> and in <laughs> some ways more rewarding, <laughs> given the <laughs> amount of money and stuff I've spent on, on building different different things. But you know, I've been a venture developer because I enjoyed building early stage things. So SOFX is one. SOFX Media is one thing. We've built Blast Talent, which is a recruiting agency. I've been involved in a number of other uh, early stage ventures, uh, sometimes technology related, sometimes uh, not so much. But to answer your question, uh, the reason I retired was actually because of my mom at that stage of the game uh, was suffering from cancer and uh, she really wasn't getting, uh, she needed an advocate and I couldn't do that from where I was in Tampa. So I basically had to uh, retire a, a bit Earlier than I had planned, I was probably planning to be a captain or an 06 for another couple of years, uh, at least, um, to make it to about the 25 year mark. It just, that situation, that life situation uh, curtailed that. So I, you know, had to leave, take care of her in the cross her sort of two remaining years. And then, um, then went into the SOFX report being one venture I started. And then there was, there were other ones that I would, I have been involved in over the past 10 years. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. Is F is S O F X. Is that your main, is that like your, your main baby or. Correct. Yeah. It's um, if you were to look at sort of what I've been as a venture developer, what have, what have I, what have I been doing? I've basically been running almost a split, uh, a split office where half the time or with, one half of my attention, we are helping, we're doing what's called corporate venture development, assisting corporations to expand market share within the Department of Defense and more specifically the special operations community and building alignment within their teams to ensure they can execute against their promises by virtue of installing business operating systems. That's one half of the work I do. It isn't just me, there's, there's a team. The other half of the work we do is building and scaling early stage things under our own head of steam. SOFX Media being one, Blast Talent being another. Um, Zeroscope was a, is a telemedicine company that we co-founded. Uh, we've been involved with uh, to help Gators Eyewear expand. Uh, that's a much loved brand in the special operations community. Um, fantastic eyewear, still American made. And so I've had a role there, stuff like that. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. So like how, how does your training and background apply? Like you could, you know, kind of joking a little earlier about like being an entrepreneur and a Navy SEAL and like how much of that is real. Right. I mean, I think 
as an entrepreneur, you kind of face things that it's uncertain. It's kind of right. scary. I think there's half people like, you know, want to go the traditional route, get a nine to five. You know, I don't want to say it's the easy path because that's not easy. Right. But, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, I kind of related like, hey, I, I remember somebody asked me one time, like, what is it like? And I'm like, man, I just I feel like I'm in the jungle with a machete at times. And like, I'm just dropped off in the middle of nowhere. And you just got to figure it out. Sometimes you got to survive. Sometimes you have an overabundance of food. Sometimes you don't. You just have to like thrive and survive. But how, like you, you have that experience as a seal. Right. And then you now have the experience of building a really successful multiple organizations like describe that like that that's a really yeah, unique position I, I mean when you look at what it takes to build and scale early stage things it typically centers around aligning the efforts of human beings around a common goal in a condition of uncertainty and ambiguity which is not fundamentally different than what the United States does with its special operations forces capabilities. So what do I mean by that? You know, the government writ large doesn't need tons and tons and tons of soft special operations forces. It needs a handful of them that can be thrown into extremely ambiguous high risk situations with very little guidance and be told, go figure it out. Like, this is the commander's intent. The objective is this. And what the constant that's going to happen that you're going to encounter is extreme difficulty, pressure, a thousand different decisions you're going to have to make all at once and everywhere. <laughs> hmm. When you look at the business of entrepreneurial endeavors and, and the building and scaling of early stage things, it's always the condition of being under-resourced. It's always the condition of there's more tasks to do than we have time or people to do them. It's always really a question about editing, right? Editing, what are we not going to focus on? And when you look at it from the standpoint that these are both fundamentally human leadership problems, because in the big scheme of things, all a corporation is, is a, or, or an organization or a high-performing organization is a collection of people that are aligned against certain objectives. And when, and the bedrock foundational belief within the special operations community is that humans are more important than hardware, like always and everywhere. We may have the best Blackhawks in the world with the most esoteric and advanced terrain avoidance radar, so on and so forth. None of that means anything without the best pilots in the world, <laughs> the best soldiers coming out of the helicopter, right? It's, it's really all about people. When you look at early stage ventures, you're asking people to suspend reality, onboard immense amounts of risk, make tables levitate, <laughs> and, and, and fend off despair because you're on the roller coaster with me. <laughs> and so we're going to be going through this together. But ultimately, some people are cut out for that life and others, others are not. But there's a very close similarity, I think, between the two special operations community and the uh, entrepreneurial world if that makes sense yeah no yeah it absolutely does it it makes a lot it makes a lot of sense i mean so thinking about like from the time you entered service till now the world we live in like you think about drones ai like i, I think about the time i i became an entrepreneur and if i had to put a stake in the ground say like 2009 like the world is very different absolutely like I, i'm different i have kids i mean you've got mobile devices that pretty much, you know, chat GPT, all these different things. Like, do you see some parallels there with like the U.S. military there? Because even the comment around like, hey, there's Raptors, Blackhawks, you know, 35 million billion dollar things, but human capital is so important. But how are you thinking about AI technology and all these things as, as, as you kind of keep your pursuit as an entrepreneur? Right. Um, I think that you've got to be extremely focused on you know post advent of artificial intelligence tools at scale um, my sensibility is my sense of things is that things are moving so fast that it's for the most part impossible for most people to keep up to include the people that are actually building artificial intelligence and machine learning tools like it wouldn't be, 
you know, I read a certain article, I forget which one it was, but it would, it, it was a pretty well respected article that said, hey, even some of the data scientists that are building these things cannot explain how these tools are working <laughs> because right. it's, it's gotten that complex. So on the one hand, I think we are leaning well over our skis in terms of building tools that we don't that we we don't necessarily have the firmest control over i think it's going to have profound implications for industry in general i believe that a world where most humans don't have to do anything in order because the jobs are gone is a really dangerous bad world because i've lived in those worlds <laughs> Right. And when okay. you have people who are, who are, when you've got sort of extremes of wealth and then you also have time that's unproductive on people's hands, they don't feel like they're contributing towards society, building themselves. They don't feel like they're learning. They feel stuck. That's not, that's not like a good outcome. <laughs> the people in, in Silicon Valley may believe that, hey, the answer to all this is universal basic income and a tax on AGI and ML that feeds that, right? That's that's not a future worth having, right? And yeah. so we've got we've got profound shifts in the economy and an industry that is going to render things obsolete or inconsequential at a speed and pace that we've never encountered, and we are unprepared to deal with it. So I'm not trying to like say the yeah, sky God. is falling, but I worry for my kids and for the future of an America worth having <laughs> and a world worth having where computer systems are, are removing the requirement for humans to be productive at all. So ironically, my podcast is called entrepreneur Intel, right? I, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I look at your, your SOFX, like you've created a solution for a very specific community. So I think as an entrepreneur, you're you're using your experience. You're targeting a very niche, you know, market, and and you're delivering this value. What do you think as an entrepreneur, right? Like, use me for example, or just a basic entrepreneur. There's so much information out there now yes. on the web, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I hate to sound, but like, there's the Fox News, there's CNN, there's all these things on TV, and there's all these TikTok video, like. How do you how do you sift through the noise? Because on one hand, as an entrepreneur, I'm trying to stay current, but half the time, like I told my wife, this is years ago in the heat of the campaign, like 2016 ish, she's getting all frazzled, and I'm like, just stop watching. Like, right. you can't change any outcome, and like, do you really care? And she stopped watching, and she felt better, and she's not all stressed out. But then I'm like, but at some capacity, like I want to stay informed about what's going on, and I want to believe, right? But who, who do you believe? I mean, so kind of shifting from the military world sure. to the entrepreneur world, what is a guy like you, Sam, with all this? Like, how do you navigate all this data and information and media? Um, so one of the reasons I created the SOFX network and the newsletter product is because I believe then, as I do now, that the economic infrastructure regarding media companies as we understand them today, both the large social media platforms based out of Silicon Valley and then contemporary news media based out of New York and a million other places, um, that the entire economic model uh, really informed sort of perverse outcomes because the entire economic model is built on forcing people into extremes, extreme point of, points of view, uh, making people dumber at scale over time, keeping people on platform for as long as possible by virtue of the engaging some of the best, smartest engineers in the world to design electronic means of keeping people absolutely addicted to these different platforms. And not even anecdotally, objectively, there is scientific evidence that the incidence of teen suicide rates skyrocketed after the instantiation of, of several of the most popular and famous 
large scale social media platforms. So my belief back in 2013, 14 was that the, the world was hurtling toward a future not worth having by virtue of deeply distrusted media. My response to that was to create SOFX Network so that I could carve out a high trust environment for people I cared about, right? Yep. That was when I remember what, a couple of minutes ago, I used the words apolitical, mm-hmm. essentially de the news. You've probably heard the term in which is what basically the large search engines have become at this point. Good luck going to try to find a, a, a an unbiased search return, right? right. That, that doesn't happen. So my point was that my belief about the future is that human beings will do what they have always done when they're threatened, which is essentially to join tribes of people that they can trust. So I believe that the future, the way that humans will protect themselves going forward as AI consumes more of everything in its path will be a basically people coming back to hyper artisanal networks that are mini micro networks populated by people they trust or with one or two degrees of separation, mainly digital networks that have an underpinning of a human network that is backed by years and years of experiential relationship. I think that those hyper artisanal mini networks will be the, will be the breakaway enclaves for where humans derive economic benefit by virtue of their professional association. So I think that the, you know, the LinkedIn worked for a while and I think we're going to go to a, Thousands of mini LinkedIn's that, in, you know, the bet I'm making is the, that are sort of professionally denominated because people can make money there. Okay, the LinkedIn, uh, so, you know, what is SOFX Network? It's really about a collection of 30,000 of my friends and people I can verify. <laughs> right? That's, yep. that's what it is. Yep. Because I believe then, as I do now, that, that, that the electronic platforms were going to contort people's sensibilities about what it meant uh, to interact on the internet. I just could see it coming, right? I just felt it. So what, you know, what does the future mean for SOFX? Eventually we'll probably launch a private email server that is just for our community that is not, you know, being raped for, for artificial intelligence data that you can only be on if you are a human that we vetted, that we know, no yep. robots, no other things. Um, because a lot of it starts with, people's basic email service. All that free email isn't free. Right. You're coming at the expense of your privacy, right? Now you're going to spend 10 bucks a day to go get a Starbucks, but you're not going to spend 10 bucks a month to have your privacy intact. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I almost think about it like, like I'm 42, right? So like <laughs> cell phones really didn't come out till after I was 18, 19. Like I couldn't imagine having the iPhone I have today in, in middle school, high school, <laughs> yeah. I have teens down to like elementary, like I'm, I'm scared. Like the information that they're digesting quickly through TikTok and these other platforms and you can't stop it. No. I mean, all you can do is guide and, and have conversations. I mean, the kids are going to grab it. I don't care what you do. If parents are like, oh, that's why you don't give your kid a phone, whatever that is, they're, they're going to find access to it. So yes. you have to have those conversations and I'm kind of, You know, as an entrepreneur, like I joined an organization called EO, which stands for the Entrepreneur Organization, which is made up of entrepreneur founders. So I I really like what you said, because for me, that was a catalyst where like, I'll never forget walking to the first EO event. There's like a hundred entrepreneurs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like these are people that have gone through things. It's kind of like your special operations people that I would imagine you go see these guys or go have a beer. And it's like you have this immediate bond. That's my bond in the entrepreneurial world because yep. we're all, you know, we all have our our lacerations from being an entrepreneur <laughs> and share war stories and stuff like that. But I'm, yeah, I'm always really curious and interested, like how people digest the data and, you know, the future is scary. I, I, but again, I rewinding back to the 1950s, like every every decade, they're probably like, oh, this big change is coming. It's like, how do you adapt? Um, this my sense of it is, you know, I think that. 
it doesn't you don't wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out at all but this time it's serious right when they launched the internet in 94 about people could sense that it was a profound step change in 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 and let's call it sort of the technology landscape. Um, artificial general intelligence, without question, is a step change in, in technological advancement, right? It's, it's absolutely going to upend industries. It's going to do so at, at a scale and pace that is breathtaking. Um, if you look at the pace of layoffs in the technology sector they could see this coming a, probably a year before the rest of us did like if you if you actually look at when the large social media platforms started yeah. doing massive sort of layoffs mm -hmm. under the um rubric of hey we have to right size return shareholder value so on and so forth yep. they can get on a talk track all they want and say that it was really about you know trimming the fat and so on and so forth what it was really about is they had a keen insight as to what artificial intelligence was going to do for human productivity and frankly a requirement for much less people to run uh the companies that they were running <clears throat> do you find that's going to help or hurt like men and women enlisting in the military the marines i mean is that still what it was like when you when you entered relative to where it's at today like does that change anything there um I think that the, let's call them the special operators of the future, and we're already starting to see this, are going to have a, a much deeper composition of extreme technology talent. Like, I think gone are the days where uh, you will always need people to get off of a helicopter at 3 o'clock at night and deal with other people somewhere around the world mm -hmm. in, in so there will always be that. But if you really understand the nature of how warfare is changing by virtue of just even observing what's happening in the Ukraine, for instance, where people can deploy off-the-shelf technology in a very agile way, and they can weaponize things in their garage, and use it to great effect on the battlefield to essentially turn uh, or at least slow the advancement of a, of a first world extremely advanced military, which is Russia. Um, it's breathtaking. So warfare is changing as we as we see it. There's going to be a much higher technology content in everything we do. It's going to increase precision um, by a lot. It's also going to increase the cost of warfare by a lot. Because all of this stuff depends on <clears throat> semiconductors, compute power, on and on it goes. And so it's less, it's probably a, a less people centric military and it's much more uh, technology oriented. But the people that are coming in to that are going to have to be much more uh, technologically savvy to operate those systems, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think as a as a civilian, I a buddy of mine just bought that Vision Pro from Apple, yep. you know, like the new the new headset. I didn't really think anything of it. I was at his house. He's like, hey, put this on. <laughs> I mean, and I know, like, I don't know the depth of the government, but I'm sure they've had that technology for years. And that's probably like, you know, but this technology as a civilian is mind blowing on what you can do. I mean, yeah. as an entrepreneur, you think about it like, when was the iPhone released? 2006. And yeah. what you, you can literally put these vision, this vision goggle on and like deploy your work environment. And have like custom displays all over the place. I mean, it is completely wild um, on what you can do. It's it's interesting to see how you know I have this vision of the military being like a hybrid of AI and human, almost like superhuman yeah. intelligence. You have Elon Musk with Neuralink, and again, that's what I see as a civilian. There's got to be stuff behind door number two. There is that we're, <laughs> there is. That we're not even aware of, and what I'm talking yeah. about is probably five seven year old technology, but. You know, I'm just curious around like what's what's the hardest challenge you've you've been through as a as, as an entrepreneur and can you relate that to anything that you went through to become a Navy SEAL? I'm just curious. In the big scheme of things, there isn't anything that I've done in the entrepreneurial space 
that comes close to the halfway toughest days of the much less the toughest days of being a seal because it's just different right the pressure is different and the reason the pressure is different is because when you're making decisions in the special operations community more often than not they're they are well i can't say more often than not but what i can say is on many occasions the decisions you are making impact whether people are going to live and die and those are extremely difficult decisions to make and you will live with them for the rest of your life right entrepreneurialism at the end of the day if you run a company into the ground run out of money have to do the unfortunate things of of telling your team hey we we can't go forward or whatever the case may be the worst outcomes in entrepreneurialism um just don't hold a candle to the to a bad day in the seal teams right or a, or a day where you've got to make you'll make decisions in the seal teams or in special operations or in the military that you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life and yes there's some parallels to entrepreneurialism but at the end of the day people are still going to be they're going to move on with their lives right they'll find another job they'll find another opportunity yes money was lost time was lost so on and so forth but it's just it's not the same <laughs> it's just not the same no that's a that, that's amazing perspective and and what i hear is there's no reason not to go for as entrepreneur because your right. worst your worst day barely scratches the surface on, on what's really going out there in the world. I mean, that actually gives me a lot of confidence and hopefully gives well, people confidence to go out there and take risks. Because Well, the, yeah. I, I will say that there is uh, a reflection that I would share, which I think is, is powerful. Um, and I've thought of this um, quite a lot, is that there's going to come a day in, in your life, in every single human Every single human being is going to lose every single thing that they love, cherish, spent their lifetime building without question, always and everywhere. It will not matter who you are. You are going to lose everything at one point in time, or they will lose you at one point in time. And where I'm going with this is don't be the person that didn't take a swing for things that lived your life to some other set of sensibilities based on what somebody else had planned for you. Go and do the thing. If it's in your heart to try to be a Navy SEAL, go. The worst that can happen is you don't make it, but at least you tried. What you won't be is one of the dozens of people I've come across that said, I really wanted to do that, but life got in the way. I I was never able to. Same with, with, uh, with building businesses. You have an idea for something, take a swing at it. Go after it. Don't be the person that lives regret, right? Because it's just not, yeah. it's not worth it. It's, you can afford to take those risks when you should. No. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's great perspective. And on that, how can, uh, how can people connect with you or contact you? Is SOFX the best way or? Yeah, I mean, I'm super easy to, um, if they want to email me direct, it's just sam.habalock at sofx.com. If they want to receive the SOFX report, it's, it's fascinating to anybody who's interested in keeping abreast of global conflict. Uh, we've got some of the best stories each day. Um, for the same reasons that people buy books uh, that are New York Times bestsellers, except this is like actually real reporting of what's happening in the world of clandestine ops and spec ops. So it's fantastic. There's no cost. They would just go to SOFX.com and right on the home page, you can see where to where you would, you would sign up for the newsletter. Everybody's welcome. Uh, it serves the spec ops community, but it's not just for the spec ops community. So that's one way. Email me direct is fine. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, so on and so forth. But I'm more responsive on email. Um, and that's that's the best way to get, get nice, perfect. I know I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go SOFX and get on your newsletter so I can get the real information. So 
Sam, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your service. I really appreciate spending time with you today. Thank you. I had a great time. And if uh, if we need to reconvene another meeting or another uh, another uh, visit, let's do it. Awesome. Thanks. This has been another episode of Entrepreneur Intel. Thank you for joining us. For show notes or other episodes, please visit us at entrepreneurintel.com. Until next time.